the appearance of fossils of the Cambrian radiation event and his comments on Iazun canadense are on the sudden appearance of groups of allied species in the lowest known fossiliferous strata from the origin of species, 7th edition, 1872. There is another and allied difficulty which is much more serious than that alluded to above. I allude to the matter in which species belonging to several of the main divisions of the animal kingdom suddenly appear in the lowest known fossiliferous rocks. Most of the arguments which have convinced me that all of the existing species of the same group are descended from a single progenitor apply with equal force to the earliest known species. For instance, it cannot be doubted that all the Cambrian and Silurian trilobites are descended from some same crustacean, which must have lived long before the Cambrian age, and which probably differed greatly from any known animal. Some of the most ancient animals known as fossils, such as the Nautilus, are various types of lingula, are various types of annelids, such as those that made these tracks. These do not differ much from living species, and it cannot be in our theory be supposed that these old species were the progenitors of all the species belonging to the same groups which have subsequently appeared, for they are not in any degree intermediate in character. Consequently, if the theory of evolution be true, it is indisputable that before the lowest Cambrian stratum was deposited, long periods elapsed, as long as, or probably far longer, than the whole interval from the Cambrian age to the present day, and that during these vast periods the world swarmed with living creatures. Here, we encounter a formidable objection, for it seems doubtful whether the earth, in a fit state for the habitation of living creatures, has lasted long enough. Sir William Thompson concludes that the consolidation of the crust can hardly have occurred less than 20 or more than 400 million years ago, but probably not less than 98 or more than 200 million years ago. Ah, here we get to this schism, this dichotomy as to the age of the earth that worried Darwin and worried Alfred Russell Wallace, Charles Lyell, and other geologists and natural historians of the last third of the 19th century. Essentially, William Thompson, or Lord Kelvin, said that the earth could not be as old as geologists said it was because if it was, it wouldn't have the volcanoes, it wouldn't have the hot springs, it wouldn't have the geothermal gradient. You wouldn't have the increase in temperature that you have as you go down into the earth. And he said the earth, to exhibit the geothermal gradient that it, it has, had to have been much, much younger. It would have cooled off and would not have the geothermal activity if it was as old as geologists said it was, which was about two and a half billion years old. Charles Lyell, in the 1860s, had said that the Earth was probably about two and a half, and had calculated that the Earth was about two and a half billion years old. With the discovery of radioactivity, and then the understanding of radioactivity, which happened very early in this century, it was realized that here was a source of the Earth's internal heat. Here was a source of heat energy which could power the Earth and essentially produce the volcanoes and geothermal energy that you saw, and that the Earth would then be, and would probably be, much, 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 much older. And then on top of that, of course, came radiometric age dating the ability to actually age date the earth and age date rocks through radioactivity. But unfortunately, Darwin died before this happened. He didn't see the great age of the earth vindicated, which 
the concept of evolution and natural selection required that there be a great age of the earth. It required immense spans of time. Anyway, this statement that Darwin makes here is uh, this question, this, this dichotomy or this, this puzzle that he had as to the validity of evolution in a relatively short uh, period of geologic time, in a period of a relatively young earth which had been proclaimed by Lord Kelvin. These very wide limits show how doubtful the data are. And other elements may have hereafter to be introduced into the problem. Mr. Kroll estimates that about 60 million years have elapsed since the Cambrian period. But this, judging from the small amount of organic change since the commencement of the glacial epoch, appears a very short time for the many and great mutations of life which have certainly occurred since the Cambrian formation. And the previous 140 million years can hardly be considered as sufficient for the development of the varied forms of life which already existed during the Cambrian period. It is, however, probable, as Sir William Thompson insists, that the world at a very early period was subjected to more rapid and violent changes in its physical conditions than those now operating. And such changes would have tended to induce changes at a corresponding rate in the organisms which then existed. William Thompson, or Lord Kelvin, was very clearly a catastrophicist. To the question why we do not find rich fossiliferous deposits belonging to these assumed earliest periods prior to the Cambrian system, I can give no satisfactory answer. Several eminent geologists, with Sir Roderick Murchison at their head, were until recently convinced that we beheld in the organic remains of the lowest Silurian stratum the very first dawn of life. Otherwise, Murchison thought that the Cambrian radiation event was the beginning of life. Other highly competent judges, such as Charles Lyell and Edwin Forbes, have disputed this conclusion. We should not forget that only a small portion of the world is known with accuracy in terms of paleontology. Not very long ago, M. Barand added another and lower stage, abounding with new and peculiar species beneath the then known Silurian system. And now, Still lower down in the lower Cambrian formation, Mr. Hicks has found in South Wales beds rich in trilobites and containing various mollusks and annelids. Incidentally, the trilobites you see on the screen are those that were described by Baran from Czechoslovakia. And he described a very, very extensive uh, middle Cambrian uh, trilobite fauna, which was even proposed to be called the Barandian after the work that uh, Brand uh, did on these fossils. The presence of phosphatic nodules in bituminous matter, even in some of the lowest azoic rocks, probably indicates life at these periods. And the existence of the Eozoone in the Laurentian formation of Canada is generally admitted. There are three great series of strata beneath the Silurian system in Canada in the lowest of which the Eozoon is found. Sir William Logan states that their united thickness may possibly far surpass that of all succeeding rocks from the base of the Paleozoic series to the present time. We are thus carried back to a period so remote that the appearance of the so-called primordial fauna of Barand may by some be considered as a comparatively modern event. The Yuzun belongs to the most lowly organized of all classes of animals, but is highly organized for its class. It existed in countless numbers, and, as Mr. Dawson has remarked, certainly preyed upon other organic beings, which must have lived in great numbers. 
Thus the words which I wrote in 1859 about the existence of living things long before the Cambrian period, and which are almost the same as those since used by Sir William Logan, have proved true. Nevertheless, the difficulty of assigning any good reason for the absence of vast piles of strata rich in fossils beneath the Cambrian system is very great. It does not seem probable that the most ancient beds have been quite worn away by denudation, and that their fossils have been wholly obliterated by metamorphic action. For if this had been the case, we should have found only small remnants of the formations next succeeding them in age. And we find quite a bit. And they have quite a few fossils in them. They are the Cambrian period. 